<laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Rickert. I have been with IHN uh, very happily for the past uh, 14 years uh, producing co ops, job opportunities, and these wonderful webinars recently with some incredible people in our community and in Canada. So this evening, we have a very, very special guest. This is Dr. Sean Merovici. I always try to make it Italian, but I don't think yeah. it is. Right? So you did, uh, you did it well. Okay. The uh, wonderful thing about Sean, I hosted him uh, last year for uh, this uh, talk, or was it 2019? I can't remember. Uh, yeah. 2020 was a blur. I don't know, yeah. You have not stopped working. So I want to share with everybody that uh, Sean in 2010 uh, became a naturopathic doctor and he is a individual focusing on treatment of disabling neurological conditions such as traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis and stroke. He uh, practices primarily at physiologic. Now there's two physiologics, Sean. There is, but only one's open right now. Only one is open right now. Okay. And that is Toronto's premier neurological rehabilitation clinic. Sean is one of the first naturopathic doctors. This is relevant to the conversation this evening to educate patients on using medicinal cannabis and acquiring an access to cannabis for uh, medical purposes. He is the medical advisor for the Cannabis Cooking Company and is frequently asked to lecture on topics with respect to cannabis for groups and schools. Sean, of course, teaches understanding cannabis and clinical practice, a course he put together exclusively for IHN at IHN. So welcome, Sean. We cannot wait. Thank you for that introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Maybe you could just let me know if everyone can see that all right. Uh, you should be on a intro page called How to Choose and Use Cannabis. Um, so I got a raised hand. Okay, perfect. So welcome everyone to uh, this webinar and the title of this webinar. And this webinar is actually a new course I've developed um, for the general public. So it's not going to go in that much detail about the science and technical names and all that, but it's going to be a more general overview of how to choose and use cannabis. So really this course is for anyone who has um, been cannabis curious or has already tried cannabis or is using cannabis, but every time they go to buy or purchase their products, they're wondering if that is truly the right product for them in terms of getting the best personal experience and the best uh, experience in terms of their health and wellness goals. So uh, this webinar slash course has three modules. Um, I'm gonna do my best to get through as much as possible. It's about 80 slides. Um, so we'll be going at a quick pace. So please save your questions till the end. Um, the first module will be laying the foundation. So we're going to talk a little bit about cannabis as a plant, uh, as a drug, and then we're going to go into how you go about choosing the right product for, for you, for yourself. And then we'll talk a little bit about purchasing and using cannabis products. So that's when we're going to um, talk more about dosing and different methods of administration. So the first module is laying the foundation. There's a few lessons within this module. The first one's going to be what is cannabis? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then a little bit of uh, self-reflection that I want everyone to do is, um, you know, why do you want to use cannabis? So what are your goals in terms of using and purchasing cannabis? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the medicinal properties of cannabis um, in contrast to recreational use and then we'll go over safety. So first of all, what is cannabis? So although, um, well, first I'm gonna say that all cannabis is one species, cannabis sativa. 
And that's regardless of whether you see cannabis labeled as cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, um, you might find uh, cannabis afghanica, cannabis ruderalis. It's all one species, meaning that all cannabis plants can interbreed. It's kind of like dogs. So, you know, we've been breeding dogs for centuries to have different characteristics, but it's all one species. They can all breed together. And the same goes for cannabis. Although we've been breeding cannabis for centuries to, for it to have different characteristics, um, it's all one species and can breed with each other. So where did cannabis come from in the first place? So when we look at the history books, we can see that it originated in Central Asia, parts of India and Afghanistan, and it was traditionally used for ritual, spiritual practices, as well as traditional medicine and for its fiber content, what we commonly refer to as hemp products. So uh, one way in which we can classify cannabis is based on its appearance. So what we can see with our eyes, and this is called a phenotype. So there's definitely differences in the characteristics of certain plants. And that's where sativa, indica, ruderalis, all those things come into play. So when we're talking about cannabis sativa, those plants tend to be taller plants uh, with lighter buds and thinner leaves. And uh, cannabis sativa plants are thought to originate more in the Central Asia, Africa, and South America regions. Um, they also have longer, so this is sativa again, they have longer flowering times, um, up to 12 to 14 weeks. And um, they're higher in certain terpenes. And we'll get into terpenes later, but those are the essential oils within the plant that make it smell the way it does and also confer some uh, medical and recreational properties to the plant. With sativas, they tend to be higher in terpenes like alpha pinene, which is, uh, as the name suggests, is that pine scenty flavor. So that's just uh, an overview of the different plants. So now going on to indica, let me go back. So indicas tend to be shorter plants. Um, they have darker leaves, a bushier growth, and dense resin heavy buds. Um, the indica variety is thought to originate more in India, Afghanistan, and um, it has a shorter flowering period. So this is why a lot of growers like indicas because um, they flower um, sooner than a sativa would. So uh, a flowering period of about eight to 10 weeks. And indicas tend to be in higher in the terpene beta myrcene, which is more of a sedating terpene. And that's why sometimes you hear sativas have more of this sort of daytime energetic high, whereas indicas are more suited for evening, nighttime, and it gives you more of like a uh, body sedation effect. Um, there's also a variety called ruderalis, which is kind of a wild type of cannabis. Um, Afghanica is thought to be more of like um, a really high THC level type of cannabis, but it can get confusing because as I said, it's all one species really. So uh, some other classification systems were developed and you might see these types of classification systems pop up and they actually make a lot more sense. So um, one classification system is dividing it into BLD, NLD, BLH and NLH. What that basically means is broad leaf drug, narrow leaf drug, broad leaf hemp, and narrow leaf hemp. So when we're talking about broad leaf drug, as I mentioned previously, it's these indica varieties that have more of those broad leaves. And so when we're talking about broad leaf, we're referring to really that indica variety. When we're talking about narrow leaf, we're more referring to that sativa variety. Drug means that the THC content in that plant is greater than 0.3%. So anything under 0.3% can be classified as industrial hemp. And that's where you see the H come in. So the H means hemp. So we have broadleaf hemp and narrow leaf hemp. So that's just one other classification system that's out there that um, you guys should know about. Again, so here we can see how according to the phenotype, cannabis plants look different from each other. Um, you got those big, tall sativa plants, those shorter, bushier indica plants, and there's the wild type uh, ruderalis plant there. 
So another way to classify cannabis is not based on its appearance, but based on what's actually inside of the plant. So this is where we get into something called a chemotype, which is what's in the actual plant. And there's four chemotypes within the cannabis kingdom. So type one is, we refer to that mostly as recreational cannabis, because you're dealing with something with a very high THC content. So the THC ratio to CBD, and we'll get into all these cannabinoids later, um, is greater than or equal to 10 to one. So 10 parts THC to one part CBD. Type two is a mix. So it's like a balanced type of cannabis, which has almost equal parts THC and CBD. This is more of the medicinal type of cannabis. Um, when we're talking medicinal cannabis, we're usually choosing uh, varieties that do have a significant amount of CBD and THC in the plant. Then type three is more of the industrial hemp plants where there's a negligible THC, but can be actually quite high in CBD. And then type four is not something you'll come across um, all too much, but uh, that's high CBG hemp. CBG is another cannabinoid. It's like the parent cannabinoid. Um, kind of all the other cannabinoids are sort of made from CBG. And in these plants, they lack certain enzymes that convert CBG into THC and CBD and all that stuff. Um, so we find high levels of CBG, which is not psychoactive, but is anti-inflammatory. Um, we're not gonna go into all these cannabinoids. We're gonna stick to THC and uh, CBD for this lecture. But if you join us next month for the in-depth course, uh, we are gonna go get into all those cannabinoids. Strains. So strains is what you'll commonly hear about cannabis. You know, what strain was that? So all strain is, is basically a combination of its phenotype. So what we can see about the plant. So think of, you know, the difference between a sativa plant and an indica plant and its chemotype. So what's inside of that plant? You know, is it a high THC plant? Is it a more balanced THC to CBD plant? Or is it a high CBD plant? Um, now, Chemotypes, so these phenotypes and chemotypes have adapted to different geographical regions. So we do see that, you know, from certain regions around the world, we get more of a particular type of combination chemotype phenotype. And that's what we commonly refer to as um, land strains um, or like classic strains of cannabis, um, pure genetic lines. Um, and some of those that you'll maybe hear pop up or Durban poison, Thai, you know, obviously originated in Thailand, um, Malawi gold originating in Hawaii, Kush actually originates in the Hindu Kush mountain region of uh, Afghan uh, Afghanistan, yeah, Afghanistan. And uh, Hayes, um, I think, uh, actually, I forget where Hayes first originated from, um, but it's a sativa, so I think it might be Africa. So again, just to reiterate, uh, although there's all these names out there for cannabis, it's all cannabis sativa. Uh, it's all one species. All the differences is how we classify these plants. Um, so again, think of it as dogs. You know, every dog's a dog, but you know, German Shepherd looks different from a Rottweiler and, and so on and so forth. So What's in cannabis? Uh, let's talk about some of these cannabinoids. So the most uh, common ones that you'll encounter um, are THC, also known as de uh, Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and CBD, cannabidiol. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit more about those two cannabinoids. But just so you know, there are some other common ones that are becoming more common. So even on the Ontario Cannabis Store, you can now find oils that are high in CBN, for instance, cannabinol, um, which I found find kind of amusing because CBN is basically like a breakdown product of THC. So um, it's one way to tell how old a cannabis plant is because if it's high in CBN, it's, it's quite old. Um, but uh, CBN has some unique characteristics too. It's very good for um, sedation and sleep. So um, there is a product, I know of at least one product by Soleil that's a high CBN oil. And THCV, another cannabinoid, um, that's getting a lot of research recently into its um, weight loss potential. Because um, as 
you probably have heard of, a lot of cannabinoids and cannabis in general can be an appetite stimulant, whereas THCV is actually an appetite suppressant. So THC, this is probably the most common well-known cannabinoid. Um, just a sec, gotta load up something here. Um, so some of the effects of THC, so it's the principal psychoactive ingredient, um, meaning that it's basically THC that's getting you high um, when you uh, consume cannabis, if you're consuming cannabis with THC in it. Um, but it does have some medicinal properties too. It offers neurological protection. It's analgesic, meaning pain relieving. It's antispasmodic, antiemetic, so um, for nausea vomiting. So one of the first uh, medical conditions that cannabis was approved for um, is, uh, is nausea and um, as an appetite stimulant in cancer and HIV. So um, there you go, appetite stimulant, uh, amplify sensory function. So this is uh, basically a very fancy way of saying what we experience when we're high. So colors can be brighter, smells more, more potent, uh, sounds louder, that sort of thing, um, can induce a sense of euphoria and creativity. Um, side effects of THC, dry mouth, dry eyes, uh, can cause disorientation, can cause short-term memory loss. Um, and this is more, um, these are more experienced with high levels of THC that are not balanced with CBD, especially this short-term memory issue. Um, which was a big sort of headliner um, for uh, one, of the, one of the many reasons why minors should be careful about cannabis use because it's, um, it can cause that short-term memory loss. Uh, increased heart rate and not only increased heart rate, but a drop in blood pressure. So we'll see that coming up, but one sort of contraindication or, or just something that should be followed by a practitioner is those individuals with a pre-existing heart condition or cardiovascular disease when they're taking uh, cannabis because that THC can affect their heart rate and their blood pressure. In fact, I had one case, um, a patient of mine who had low blood pressure, um, you know, got a job promotion, went out partying, um, drank some alcohol, and then had some, had some cannabis and fainted because just the combination of everything dropped his blood pressure way too far. Uh, anxiety and uh, paranoia are also some common side effects with uh, THC. So some of the contraindications uh, for THC um, is if there's any history of psychosis, um, including schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, um, heart disease, as I mentioned, um, it's not a strict contraindication, but just needs to be followed by a physician. Um, a history of addiction. So that's sort of a complicated one because um, CBD, for instance, has been shown in some recent studies to help with addiction. Um, so being able to wean people off of cannabis in general, as well as alcohol and opiates. Pregnancy and breastfeeding, so definite contraindication in pregnancy. However, breastfeeding, uh, there's a lot of back and forth on that issue. Um, for instance, one of the sort of gurus of uh, breastfeeding here in uh, Toronto, at least, is Dr. Jack Newman. And his stance is that basically with, you know, occasional use, there's no reason to be that too concerned about uh, the THC crossing into the milk supply, because some does, they've definitely found THC in breast milk. But the question is, is it physiologically enough, a high enough level to cause anything of concern? And uh, Dr. Newman doesn't necessarily think so if the mother is just sort of an occasional user. However, there were some studies to suggest that it may cause some um, decreased in sort of um, developmental milestones and, and things like that, but it wasn't definitive. So really um, nothing's been definitive about that so far. So in that circumstance, I like to just advise against it if possible. So moving on to CBD, cannabidiol, um, there's no apparent psychoactive effects of CBD. So basically that means you won't get 
high from CBD. However, it does interact with brain chemistry. It's just not going to induce that high feeling that you get with THC. CBD is an antioxidant. Um, so, um, you know, it prevents free radical damage and anti-inflammatory. It's actually a very powerful anti-inflammatory. So I've been working with CBD now for about six, seven years. Prior to that, you know, as a naturopath, I was using all the stuff you guys probably know of, curcumin, boswellia, um, eggshell membrane, um, you know, hops, yeah, you know, name it, I've been using it. And I found that CBD is, is uh, actually on the top, like top two in terms of how effective it is as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, antidepressant. Um, so there's definitely some antidepressant uh, uh, qualities with CBD. And we do see in some of the studies that it does interact with our 5-HTP receptors. So there's potentially some serotonin modulation happening with CBD. An anti-epileptic, so that's really where the bulk of research in terms of uh, CBD is happening right now as an anti-epileptic. And we'll get into a little bit of how that works in epilepsy, but um, you know, it's been studied, it's been well studied, uh, especially with kids. Uh, an analgesic, again, just like THC was, um, so for pain, antispasmodic, again, like THC. So you can see how the two can work together quite well and modulates the endocannabinoid system and THC activity. So we're going to talk about the endocannabinoid system, which is basically a system in our body um, that all these compounds interact with and, and why they have effects on us in the first place. So let's take a step back at this point and um, ask ourselves the question again, why am I interested in using cannabis? So is it for, is it to improve my sleep? Is it for stress relief? Um, is it to enhance my mood? Is it for pain relief? Is it just for fun? Um, or, and this I've had several patients um, inquire about it from this perspective, is to uh, have an alcohol replacement. So to wean off of alcohol or just to have a different option from alcohol. So now the question is, now that we have a sense of why we want to use it, um, what product's going to be the best suited for my needs and wants? That's what we're really interested in. So, First question we want to ask ourselves is, when will I be using this product? Am I going to be using this product during the daytime or am I going to be using it at nighttime? So do I want something that has an energizing effect, um, an uplifting effect, or do I want something with more of a relaxing, sedating, pain relief effect, or am I just taking it for general health and wellness? And uh, we'll get into a little bit of how to choose that. So what product's gonna work best for the intended time of day? Okay, so now we know what I wanna use it for and what time of day I'll likely be using it. So just keep those in the back of your head. So, you know, let's say I want to use it for, you know, I've been suffering from some insomnia, I wanna use it for sleep, so I'm gonna be taking it at nighttime. So that opens up some, uh, uh, potential varieties and products for us because if we're using at night we can potentially have some THC in there because um, we're not going to be you know working driving around operating machinery so if that THC does induce a little bit of a high it'll be okay um, and also for sleep we want to make sure that it's got the right cannabinoids and the right terpenes in there that's going to be relaxing and sedating so a little bit more on the foundation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the medicinal properties of cannabis. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, cannabinoid receptors, endocannabinoids. So, you know, why we have this system in the first place is because we actually produce cannabinoids internally and they're called endocannabinoids. Our two main ones are called 2-AG and anandamide. Um, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, Oh, I see a raised hand. Okay, I'll get to that. Uh, we're mostly going to be talking about um, just an overview of the endocannabinoid system for the purposes of this webinar. Um, 
So a harm reduction via retrograde inhibition. So basically what um, endocannabinoids do in general and what the endocannabinoid system is set up to be is a harm reduction system. So meaning that when signals are firing too much or things go a little bit haywire in the body, it's the endocannabinoid system's job to put into place homeostasis again. So dial everything back. Um, I like to sometimes refer to it as, you know, a sprinkler system, right? So when things start catching on fire, it sends a signal to the sprinkler system, which turns on, puts out the fire and, um, and basically that's how it all works. And retrograde inhibition just means that, you know, when that signal gets too intense, it in turn sends a signal back saying, let's put out those endocannabinoids to put out that fire. So here's our endocannabinoid system. Um, so we have many cannabinoid receptors, not just two, but the most well studied are CB1 and CB2. So cannabinoid receptor one, cannabinoid receptor two. Uh, cannabinoid receptor one is found mostly in our central nervous system. So as you can see, there a lot of dots in the brain and down the spine. And then cannabinoid receptor two are found more in like organ systems. And they're sort of more involved in our immune system and just keeping our organs in a state of balance and homeostasis where the endocannabinoid or the cannabinoid receptor one is more involved in our neurological system. Um, so uh, reducing uh, brain activity and um, muscle firing, peripheral nerve muscle firing, that sort of thing. And so we can see here there's um, the endocannabinoid system has far reaching effects, not just in our nervous system, but our gastrointestinal system. It helps with propulsion. Um, so one of the things that I commonly recommend um, cannabis for is um, irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, there's lots of studies that works really well for that. Um, plays a role in hormones and bones. So a lot of these cannabinoids actually help with um, osteoblast activity. So those cells that um, remineralize uh, bone. Um, so one area of research is into basically um, using cannabis for osteoporosis and osteopenia. And as you can see here, immune system. Um, what's this one? There's one hidden behind my thing here, metabolism and muscle activity. So here we have a neuron, um, so a nerve cell. And if we go back to like physiology, we know that basically there's a synapse between two nerve cells where um, neurotransmitters are basically sent through that space between the two nerve cells and that transmits a signal. This is where um, our endocannabinoids and our cannabinoids come into play. So as you can see here, and let me just move the screen. Oops, go back. Uh, sorry, I just have a screen that is blocking some of my screen. Okay, I'll try and go around it. Um, but you can see here the cannabinoids are at the at the um, postsynaptic cleft. So basically at the uh, synapse that's you know further away. And that's because if that signal is too intense, it will send those cannabinoids back to the presynaptic region there to shut down that signal. So it's all about adjusting the signal. Um, so I'm a musician. And so I like to kind of think about it as like a mixing board. So cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system are all involved in sort of adjusting those signals throughout our body. So they can adjust the volume, tone, and balance of signals in our endocannabinoid system, which is part of the nervous system, part of our muscular skeletal system, our immune system, and our endocrine system. Terpenes, which we're gonna talk about shortly, uh, can serve as axillary adjustment knobs. So the cannabinoids are the main players, but the terpenes actually can tweak things as well. So um, they're just as important as the cannabinoids. And so another thing we wanna ask ourselves is how do we want to adjust our signals? So this takes a little bit of self-reflection, but if you know yourself to be like pretty high strung individual, 
you know, you may want something that kind of calms you down a little bit. Okay, let's talk terpenes. So terpenes in general are essential oils. Um, they are the essential oils found within the cannabis plant that confer some, you know, medicinal and, and um, uh, physiological properties, but also um, a, uh, have a role to play in the flavor um, that we experience as well as the smell. Uh, so they have health promoting mood modulating properties of their own. They work synergistically with cannabinoids and you know, time and time again, we see this throughout nature and especially herbal medicine that all the different chemical components within the plant act synergistically with each other to confer the best physiological response with the least amount of side effects. So the further we get away from that whole extract of cannabis, the more potential we have for side effect with our product. Um, it, ter different terpenes can uh, cause um, differences in mood effect, in sedation, focus, uh, respiration, and digestion. And some of the common terpenes that you'll find in cannabis are linalool, which really is, um, when you think of linalool, that's the lavender smell uh, that we all know. Uh, limonene, which is basically a citrusy kind of smell. Pinene, like pine needles. Uh, myrcene has sort of an earthy smell to it. Um, Caryophyllene is, uh, so actually myrcene is found in um, uh, mango. Um, so um, you know how sometimes mango has that kind of earthy, um, I don't know, it's kind of like, it could have this sort of earthy smell to it. That's the myrcene. Uh, Caryophyllene is also found in black pepper, so it confers that sort of spicy flavor and aroma. Uh, humulene, which is part of, um, uh, like, it's, a, um, what do you call it, um, uh, that uh, mulch, like a mulchy uh, scent. Uh, terpinolene and osamine, those are sort of minor ones. So uh, let's start with pinene. So pinene's common. So we find it in cannabis. It's one of the most common terpenes in cannabis, but it's also fine within pine, rosemary, basil, parsley, and dill. Um, it has anti-inflammatory properties. It's a bronchodilator, so it opens up the airway. So if you were um, basically an asthmatic or have uh, COPD and you're using cannabis, you might want to choose strains or products that have a higher amount of pining. Um, antibiotic, um, so we'll see a lot with, with the essential oils, basically almost every essential oil is antiviral, antibiotic. That's because they disrupt their oily and they disrupt that outer sort of membrane. Um, memory enhancement, um, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, um, so basically it has this um, memory enhancement property to it um, uh, without getting into too much sort of detail about uh, conditions, you know, um, acetylcholinesterase uh, comes into play with dementia. Um, so things with pinene can be helpful for that. Uh, Alzheimer's, oh, there we go. So I, I wrote it down for myself. I'm a good boy. Uh, Alzheimer's, memory issues, asthma, bronchitis, ADHD, and fatigue would be some conditions where alpha pinene or pinene uh, would be helpful. And some strains that are high in pinene are White Widow, Ruxton, and Cold Creek Kush. These can all be found on the Ontario Cannabis Store, all these strains. Limonene, so again, that sort of citrusy scent, citrusy flavor. Um, we find it in fruit rinds, rosemary, juniper, peppermint. Um, limonene is an anxiolytic. So there was some really interesting research, more of antidepressant research, where they infused um, limonene into the air in hospital rooms. I forgot where this was done. Might have been in the Netherlands. Um, and, um, and basically, they were, you know, these patients were given like a Beck um, depression questionnaire prior to when they started this and then afterwards. And um, it had a very significant antidepressant effect, just infusing it in the air. Um, it can elevate serotonin and dopamine. So as you can see, you know, something with high limonene content plus CBD, which we already discussed, can have that sort of 5-HTP serotonin augmentation, um, might be a really good strain or product to consider for depression. 
uh, immune stimulant, uh, anti-cancer properties, antioxidant properties, uh, anxiety, depression, cancer, um, GERD. So there was actually some studies where they used um, limonene essential oil for reflux um, and it worked. And some of the strains high in limonene are super lemon haze, basically anything with a fruit name in it uh, would have a good amount of limonene, uh, Northern Lights and Girl Scout cookies. So those are some um, popular strains. Myrcene, um, so I mentioned myrcene you can find in mango, lemongrass, thyme and, and hops. Myrcene is a very good anti-inflammatory. Um, it's analgesic. It's a really good muscle relaxant and uh, has a lot of uh, sedation properties. So this is the first time we're kind of seeing a terpene that has real sedative properties. Um, so again, if you're looking for a product that might be best suited for nighttime sleep, you might want to find something with some uh, with high levels of mercy. It also helps THC cross the blood brain barrier. So it's like a double whammy. If you find something with, um, you know, a, a good amount of THC plus mercine, you're going to have an even additive effect because that mercine helps THC cross that blood brain barrier, which is in place to kind of keep things out of the brain. But um, one of the challenges in medicine is to get certain drugs into the brain. And so we have a lot of drugs that have been manipulated to help them get through that blood brain barrier. And myrcene does that. And myrcene is found pretty much in all cannabis plants, but some have higher levels than others. So again, that synergy. Um, it's uh, helpful for pain, spasms, insomnia, nausea. And again, some strains where you'll find high levels of myrcene are mango, strawberry ice, and sensitar. Linalool. So remember we talked about linalool and lavender. So that's really where we find high levels of linalool in nature. Um, it's in lavender and, and cannabis. Has sedative properties. So, you know, think of lavender, why we use lavender to calm us down for sleep at nighttime. Um, it's an anxiolytic, it's an analgesic, pain relief anti-convulsant. Um, so again, pain, insomnia, anxiety, and seizures would be some uh, conditions that you might want to look for something with high linalool content. And some uh, strains that are high in this are the Kush varieties. So Pink Kush uh, is a really popular strain from, um, oh, I think a few licensed producers make um, are growing Pink Kush, but um, the one I'm thinking of is um, San Rafael. Um, Afghan Kush, um, oh, there's another licensed producer that makes Afghan Kush and Tangerine Dream, again, a San Rafael product. Karyophyllene, uh, that's that peppery spicy terpene. Um, so find this in black pepper, cloves, and cinnamon. So karyophyllene has anti-inflammatory properties. So you see a lot of these terpenes have anti-inflammatory properties. The big one with uh, karyophyllene is it um, has these gastroprotective properties. Um, so really good uh, for someone who's had, you know, um, gastritis or, um, or, or any condition really of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, a really interesting thing is it's one of the only things we found that has direct uh, action on our cannabinoid receptors aside from actual cannabinoids. So karyophyllin actually interacts a little bit with our cannabinoid receptors. Um, it's helpful for pain, inflammation, and ulcers, and uh, some strains are GG4, kosher kush, I love these names, and uh, blackberry cream. Cumuline, um, so that's that really sort of earthy mulchy one, um, found in hops, coriander, cloves, and basil. Um, it's very good anti-inflammatory. So uh, one interesting thing was, um, oh, I gotta remember what the name of the stuff we used. Um, peat, that's what it is. So peat, that's what I'm thinking of. When I'm talking about mulch, I'm thinking about peat. So when I was uh, an intern back in um, uh, the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, we had in our treatment rooms, we had peat baths. Uh, so big, huge, like stainless steel baths, um, which we would uh, fill up with hot water and then put in um, peat, this sort of like earth, like a, a sterilized form of peat, you know, it wasn't just right from the outside. But um, the peat, and this is from traditional medicine, 
was thought to in, incur an anti-inflammatory effect to the patient. And I've, I used those PEEP baths a lot when I was, um, when I was studying in school there um, for patients with arthritis. I remember clearly I had one patient um, who had juvenile arthritis, a young girl, nothing was working. I threw her in PEEP bath and it worked fantastically. So again, um, it does have a really good anti-inflammatory property similar to a steroid. Um, it's antifungal, anti-cancer, uh, inflammation, cancer, fungal infection. There you go. Um, and some of the strains, super skunk, black cherry punch, uh, pink grapefruit haze. Okay, so uh, terpenes have an effect on their own, but they also act synergistically with cannabinoids to adjust that signal. All right, let's talk about safety. Um, so tips, tricks, absolute and relative contraindications for cannabis use. My first suggestion is to be confident about where your cannabis is coming from. So just like we obsess about where our supplements are coming from and you know, are they free of heavy metals and um, contaminants and pesticides, we wanna have this sort of same um, um, you know, benchmark for our cannabis products. And one way to be confident about that is to choose products that are part of the legal market, whether it's um, recreational or the medicinal market. You know, there's a lot of, um, let's call it uh, gray market dispensaries and products out there. And, you know, some of them might be good, but we just, we don't know. Um, because I doubt any of those products or any of those dispensaries will give you information about whether it was third party tested or um, a guarantee that it's, you know, um, held to a certain standard in terms of solvent level if we're dealing with an extract. Um, but, you know, that's all things that, that the government sort of oversees. So here's some uh, ways to um, tell if your product is part of the legal system. Um, so in Canada here, we've got that sort of, um, what is that, a hexagon shape with uh, THC in it. Um, you know, in California, it looks a little bit different. Colorado looks a little bit different. Um, so I sort of developed this uh, webinar or course for um, people even outside of Canada. So I wanted to include some of that as well. One way to tell if the store or dispensary that you're purchasing your cannabis products from is a legal one is they're required to have this symbol in their front door. Um, so right at the front window, uh, Ontario authorized in, in Ontario. Um, so know your source, um, you know, is it traceable? So all the licensed uh, producers that have been licensed by the, um, by the government of Ontario or the Canadian government, um, they can tell you, they can tell you, you know, what batch that product came from and how it was grown, where it was grown, what it was used to grow it, that sort of thing. A great way to find out some of that information beyond just going on to the Ontario Cannabis Store is to actually visit the websites of those licensed producers. Um, they've all been third party tested. Um, you know, recalls and returns are all dealt with through the government. Um, there's certain regulatory requirements for cannabinoid percentages. And, you know, these are always evolving. Um, and uh, it can be at times frustrating that, you know, every time I go to the Ontario Cannabis Store, it's kind of have different information on it and the way the information is presented a little bit different. So, you know, it is evolving, um, but uh, you will always see um, at least percentages of THC and CBD and, and that sort of thing. Um, what solvents, so solvents are used to extract cannabinoids when we're making an extract like an oil. So um, the government has pretty strict requirements as to how much solvent can be left inside the final product and it's very, very low. Um, so we wanna make sure that that's being taken care of. Uh, contamination, strains, you know, identifying strains so that you are, if you're buying pink kush, you're actually getting pink kush. Um, so unless you're growing yourself, it's the best way to make sure you're getting a safe and accurate product. So moving on with safety. So cannabis is, you know, I would go beyond saying relatively safe drug. It's a very, very safe drug. Um, so the LD50 means basically like what is a lethal dose in 50% of people who take that dose. So, um, you know, 
for THC, the LD50 is uh, 1,270 milligrams per kilogram, whereas aspirin is 200 milligrams per kilogram and heroin would be 21.8 milligrams per kilogram. So basically how you can think of it is you'd need to eat a thousand brownies, cannabis brownies with a hundred milligrams of THC, which is an insane amount. I mean, most people are going to be consuming somewhere between five and 10 milligrams of THC um, in one setting, sitting, sorry, to reach the LD50. So it, it's, it's an impossibly attainable amount. So there's really never any risk of dying from cannabis. You will find people who get admitted to the hospital, but because that's because they're having side effects from the THC that are uncomfortable, but are they at any severe risk or severe health concern? Not really. Um, however, we need to discuss adverse effects, contraindications, and dependence. Those are real things about cannabis that we should know about. So adverse effects. Um, so in, there was a meta-analysis done of uh, 23 randomized controlled trials and eight observational studies. Um, they found 97% um, of the adverse effects were non-serious. So, you know, dizziness, headache, dry eye, dry mouth, nausea, so on and so forth. There was 3% of the adverse effects in this meta-analysis were serious, which were vomiting, urinary tract infection, and an MS relapse. So, you know, obviously they were um, uh, targeting uh, a lot of patients with MS. However, in the discussion of that study, they comment that the incidence uh, or the, uh, the rate of serious adverse effects in this group was no higher than that of the control group. So the control group who wasn't actually consuming cannabis had a similar rate of serious adverse effects, the vomiting, UTI, and MS relapse. So it's quite likely that the cannabis might not have even been the culprit of these serious adverse effects. Some contraindications, so some are absolute and some are relative. Um, so we already talked about pregnancy and lactation a little bit. So I would say that's a relative contraindication because for instance, if we have a mother who's suffering from severe anxiety, depression, and is finding that you know a CBD product with maybe little THC is really the only thing helping her, you know, it, do we take her off of that medicine just because we're concerned about some of that THC crossing the milk supply? Probably not. But if you know the mother's just doing it for fun, uh, then maybe we would advise against holding off until breastfeeding is finished. Psychosis is an absolute at this point, even though there's some studies to suggest that when we use CBD um, with, uh, with either very low THC levels or no THC, it can actually be helpful for some uh, types of psychosis. Uh, unstable cardiac conditions, we talked about because of THC's effect on heart rate and blood pressure, COPD and asthma. This is more of a concern from um, the standpoint of smoking cannabis um, because just like tobacco smoke, uh, anything combusted will produce um, some irritants for the airways. Uh, children and teens, um, so again, a relative because with uh, children with severe epilepsy, a CBD product might be the way to go. And actually, I would advocate for a CBD product being either a first line or second line uh, product to try with uh, severe epilepsy in, in children. Uh, <clears throat> teens, uh, we'll get into a little bit of dependency issues um, with teens, but basically there's... Um, like a seven times greater chance of uh, having a, a dependency on cannabis if, uh, if the person consumes it before the age of, uh, I think it was 18 or 19. Um, for some fertility things, so uh, we go into this in much more detail in the full sort of course, cannabis course. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, it doesn't seem to affect fertility for the most part. There's some studies one way, there's some studies the other way. Um, one thing I would say is that if a man has a history of um, testicular, oh, there it is, testicular cancer, there are some studies to maybe suggest um, not using cannabis. Interactions. So 
this is one, another important area to know about cannabis in general is that both THC and CBD can have an effect on our liver metabolism. CBD more so than THC actually. Um, so they inhibit liver enzymes, meaning that if you were to take a drug like a medication, the uh, net effect would be that that drug stays in the system longer and might have more of a potent effect. So it's one thing we want to watch out for. Now, all the studies that showed that that can actually happen were in um, primarily in kids taking quite massive doses of CBD. We're talking about 300 milligrams of CBD per day in a, in a child. Um, and they noticed, and this was with epilepsy, that some of the epilepsy, not all of them, but some of the anti-epileptic drugs were actually starting to um, increase in the, um, in the blood with, with the CBD. There's no clearly established cutoff. You know, we can't say, okay, this amount of CBD is safe, but this one isn't. However, we know we've only really seen that effect when we're talking about, you know, things in excess of 200, 300 milligrams of CBD. So my rule of thumb is if someone's taking less than 100 milligrams of CBD per day, probably not to worry, but it's something that should be monitored at least for a few weeks anyway. Um, some of the uh, drugs to watch out for, which they do have some information that can be affected by CBD in particular, are warfarin, clobazam, and, uh, and alcohol, of course. It has additive sedative effect with alcohol. Um, so there was an increase in clobazam levels at a dose of, uh, um, ep, ep, I always mispronounce uh, this one, Epidiolex, um, which is a uh, pharmaceutical CBD product at 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. So let's say, you know, a 70 kilogram male, um, you know, we're talking pretty high dose, like, you know, 100, uh, you know, uh, over a gram of, um, of CBD and warfarin at five milligrams per kilogram per day. So pretty high doses. Dependence. So uh, this is a really great graph um, I like to use because it really puts things into perspective. So on the bottom axis, the X axis, or I don't know, one's X, one's Y, but the bottom, the horizontal axis, um, we can see you know, what, at what concentration are we gonna have a lethal dose of that drug? And on the vertical axis, um, what's the um, prevalence of dependency with that drug? So we could see that um, marijuana is low or a moderate low level of dependency and a quite a low um, uh, active slash lethal dose. So it's actually quite safe. And we could see, you know, like caffeine, for instance, is uh, potentially more lethal and just as um, habit forming as, uh, as marijuana. And look at alcohol, you know, it's, it really puts things in perspective because like, for so long, there was so much taboo surrounding cannabis, but, you know, you could freely buy as much alcohol as you want. But, you know, if we look at the science, alcohol is a way more dangerous drug than cannabis is. Same with nicotine. And also, I like to show it like psilocybin, right? Um, so magic mushrooms, a psychedelic compound is like super safe, which I find really interesting too, and, and LSD for that matter. Um, okay, so dependence versus addiction. So, you know, addiction is basically, um, they, you know, an individual can't stop even if it's interfering with activities of daily living, whereas dependence, um, they, they can stop. Uh, so that's one distinction. So 30% of users of cannabis develop um, some sort of dependence or use disorder uh, where it's difficult to come off of it. And that might be for a variety of reasons, you know, maybe they're taking it and it's just really helping something like their anxiety or the mood or their sleep. So, you know, why would they want to stop using it? Um, so less than 19 years of age is four to seven times more likely to develop dependence. And what we see as sort of um, um, a withdrawal effect, if you will, is there can be, if, if we had someone with cannabis dependency, stop them cold turkey. They could have some irritability, moodiness, sleep disruption, decreased appetite cra cravings, um, restlessness, and it can last for up to two weeks. And this is mostly a concern, dependency in general is mostly concerned with THC and high THC levels, not really that uh, concerned with CBD. 
Okay, how are we doing? Oh, we're almost at, at time. So I'm going to try and fly through at least module two here. So choosing the right product. Um, so strain cannabinoids, terpenes method of its administration. So we, I'm going to fly through strain cannabinoids and terpenes. We'll get to method of administration. Um, cannabinoids, uh, we talked about that. That's just an overview. Talked about that. Talked about that. Okay, methods of administration. So really there's three basic ways that we can take cannabis um, through inhalation, orally, or topically. Inhalation, um, really break it down into two uh, ways that we can inhale cannabis and that's either through smoke or vapor. Um, so um, the, with smoking and vaporization, so it's either gonna come in the form of um, an oil, a wax, a rosin, or a flower. So, you'll be either smoking those or vaporizing those forms. And smoke-free methods pose less risk and are medically preferred. So vaporization is way preferred over smoking. And when I have patients who've been smoking cannabis for a long time and it's been helping with X, Y, and Z, I try and convert them at least onto vaporization because basically with vaporization, we're not combusting any plant material. So we don't have the tar and the carcinogens um, being inhaled. Uh, decrease respiratory uh, symptoms in cannabis users who vaporize. And that was a study that looked at vaporization versus smoking. And there was a decrease in symptoms, respiratory symptoms. Vaporization. Uh, one thing, it can produce a stronger effect than smoking. So that's something to watch out for. Um, regulated markets. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, solvents. So some of the common solvents used to make those extracts that are used for vaporization is ethanol. So basically like alcohol, like drinking alcohol, carbon dioxide and butane. Um, so, uh, you know, when we go, when we're looking at the recreational and medicinal markets that are legal, um, we really don't have to be concerned about what solvents being used because they're all brought to levels that are, you know, not uh, potentially harmful for our health, but if we go into the gray market, um, there have been some incidences with um, BHO, so that's butane hash oil, um, and uh, where they kept too much butane in the final product and that was having um, detrimental health effects. Stay away from products with carrier agents like glycerin. Um, so you wanna make sure there's no additives in the extract. Oils, um, basically the same starter material as in a vape cartridge with a carrier oil. So this is when they're putting in a carrier oil, which will commonly either be medium chain triglycerides, MCT oil, hemp, or olive oil. Um, the absorption of oils in terms of THC is 30% to 50% more absorbable than CBD. However, it's almost the reverse topically. So when you get a topical product that has THC in it, it's not gonna do anything. CBD will though they'll be um, absorbed uh, quite well and will have its anti-inflammatory effects. Consuming with other fats increases absorption, just like taking fish oils and that sort of thing. Um, let's go through that. Uh, so you can find oils in a spray bottle. You can find it in capsules and capsules are getting cheaper by the day. They used to be extremely expensive. Now they're reasonable. Um, beverages, again, some of these things are fun to try recreationally, but are costly. So it's not something you'd want to take like on a daily basis. Um, now there's even dissolvable strips. Um, they're about $3 a strip, so it can be a little bit pricey. Um, and then um, edibles. So edibles are basically an oil uh, inside a food or a beverage. Um, so one thing about edibles is that uh, it's, you know, an unpredictable onset. So it can take up to six hours and have a duration up to 20 hours. I think that's a little extreme. Um, topicals um, do not absorb systemically. It's more of a local effect. Um, CBD absorbs better than THC, as I talked about, um, used for inflammation, pain. Uh, we actually had um, a CBD oil in the clinic for a while that was... Um, patients were really liking for arthritis. Um, and how it's made is basically you choose a wax, you melt it down, choose a moisturizer, uh, mix it in, mix in your oil, uh, mix in any other therapeutic agents like you know menthol or eucalyptus or whatever, and then put it in a delivery device. 
Okay, I think that's all we have time for for today. But uh, don't feel too bad because we have a really super intensive course we're offering in about a month's time. So uh, definitely sign up for that if you found this interesting and are thirsty for more. I'll take some questions now. I'll, I'll stick around because we didn't have time for the whole presentation. Let's say I'll stick around for about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, okay? We've got three modules and I come back after 45 minutes and the end of module one. <laughs> that, that I knew was, it. No, that's good. Even when we had you for three and a half hours that uh, a couple of years ago, it was you went through as much as you possibly could because there's just so much amazing stuff. Very good. Thank you so much. Now, um, if you wouldn't mind, stop screen sharing so you can pop back up full. And then we've got some questions here. That was fantastic. Whenever you, when you brought that chart up uh, with the um, uh, cannabis, the alcohol, the nicotine, LSD, the psilocybin, I always think at IHN for uh, psychology of disease, we have Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, the biology of belief, and now he's working yeah. on another uh, arena with um, low dose uh, LSD and psilocybin for um, some interesting effects. So, but yeah. Sean, you are just an absolute wealth of knowledge. You're so generous and you get so granular about things that um, it is, um, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you teaching at IHN. Now, when does the cannabis uh, course start? I believe That's it's next question. month. It's next month it's that next we month have it. Time. Yeah, it's four sessions and yeah. it's an evening course and it's online and uh, it's going to be fantastic. Four, four weeks of cannabis. Four weeks of cannabis. And the last one, um, do we do cooking? Um, a little bit of cooking in the last one, culinary? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we did that last time we ran the course and it was actually a lot of fun. So I have some ideas maybe uh, for this time to even make things a little bit simpler and, and more fun. Okay, very cool. Um, Faye would like to know what is the best for a preventative approach? And I'm not sure what um, we mean by that. Do you, do you know she asked that right at the top? Um, and if Faye, uh, if you're still maybe... Okay. Probably maybe for just like general health. Maybe. Okay. Purposes. Okay. Um, so um, if, if that's kind of where you're getting at, I would um, likely choose something that's um, high CBD and very low THC uh, because you'll have less potential for side effect. Plus you'll get all the great effects of that CBD. Um, and, uh, as we know, unless you're, you know, taking massive amounts of CBD and are on other medications, very safe to do that, um, to, to take that CBD as you would any other anti-inflammatory that you take on a regular basis. Okay. Thank you. Can you take CBD, um, while on SSRIs? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we're doing high amounts of CBD, I will definitely follow the patient closely for a couple of weeks just to make sure there's no symptoms of uh, serotonin syndrome. But to this date, I haven't seen anything like that. Uh, actually, sorry, I had one patient who was a very, very sensitive patient who was on two SSRIs, um, a short acting and a long acting and was taking CBD and started to get um, what was the main symptom he was getting um, some like tremor, like some shakiness. And I was like, okay, um, let's, you know, I was, I was more inclined to say, let's try and get you off one of the SSRIs. But, uh, the easiest thing to do at that point was to dial back the, the, uh, CBD. Um, really not a concern. Is CBD oil safe in children? Yes. Yes. So, um, as I mentioned, um, there's lots of studies, uh, specifically with epilepsy um, in children. And so it's been extremely helpful for some severe forms of it, like Dravet syndrome and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Um, and the only side effects we saw with those kids who were taking really high doses of CBD were some um, lethargy. And this wasn't in all kids, but you know, these were some of the common things that did come up with some of the kids were um, lethargy, change in appetite, uh, some stomach upset, um, but uh, nothing serious at all. 
um, even at massive doses. The, the only sort of thing that kind of piqued the uh, researchers was when they were taking specific anti-epileptic drugs, anti drugs, and um, they, they would see that the liver enzymes would increase a little bit and the drug would increase a little bit. Um, so they were a little concerned about that. But um, in general, um, safe for kids. I mean, if you're going to be using cannabis with kids, you do need a, uh, a medical uh, license and prescription though. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, is, uh, or does using cannabis interfere with the natural endocannabinoid system, particularly by competing for the endocannabinoid receptors? So um, CBD, and we, we didn't have a chance to really talk about how CBD really works, but the short answer is no, because um, while THC does uh, act directly on those cannabinoid receptors, and there might be more of a, um, of a potential to disrupt the endocannabinoid stuff, uh, uh, system with high levels of THC, mm -hmm. CBD doesn't even bind to our cannabinoid receptors. Instead, what it does is to prevent the breakdown of our endocannabinoids um, at that sort of synaptic cleft that we saw. So just like um, antidepressants like SSRIs basically increase our serotonin levels by preventing them to be broken down, same thing with CBD is it basically prevents the breakdown of our endocannabinoids or doesn't prevent it, but it slows down that breakdown. So um, from that perspective, it's, it's an indirect effect um, and that makes it uh, much safer because it's actually not really um, going directly onto our cannabinoid receptors. So it won't cause those receptors to kind of like upregulate, downregulate like THC would. Okay, thank you. This is a, the next one is a good question about your knowledge base. And that is where can one go other than of course, doing a, a short for, day course with us, but where could you go? Is there an institution for learning more about cannabis? But I'm sure there is a lot, of, there are rather a lot of online programs nowadays too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of online stuff. I would say from like a, um, just like an easy to digest standpoint, uh, Leafly is a great resource. Um, so if you go to uh, Leafly, I think it's leafly.com. Um, it's like a cannabis, an online cannabis magazine slash um, publication slash resource. And they've got some great articles, um, some good videos, you know, nothing like goes into super depth, but it's really um, informative and easy to digest information. I just want to put it in the chat here, leafly.com. Yeah. I, yeah. Let me double Leafly. check that. It's .com. Leaf. Uh, L E F L Y dot com. -E -F -L -Y. Sorry, it's dot C A. I didn't even realize it was Canadian. Leafly dot C A. Okay, thank you. Good. Um, Rachel. Oh, excellent question. What about athletic uses for cannabis, particularly runners? You're going to have to enroll in the course. We have a whole section on that. Um, but uh, basically it's very, so cannabis and sport and athletics is a really interesting field of study. Um, you know, one thing that uh, this epidemiologist uh, discovered when they were first looking into cannabis and um, exercise in general, is they sort of did this study thinking that, okay, we're probably gonna see that cannabis users are a little less active. Um, they're, they uh, are generally a little bit heavier um, that sort of thing. They found the exact opposite. Um, the cannabis users actually exercise more hours per week and were leaner. So that sparked a whole amount of research. And they've been doing research with cannabis and sports since the 1950s, um, you know, from figuring out if there's effects on, you know, focus, like both pro and detrimental effects in sport. Um, definitely in certain sports, you wouldn't want to be using cannabis like a race car driver. Um, but in other sports, um, it may confer some benefit. Like for instance, when athletes have, um, you know, a bad, uh, let's say a, a bad outcome or, um, you know, a bad race or whatever, and it's induced some post-traumatic stress that, you know, creeps up every time they need to perform like performance anxiety, uh, cannabis can 
extinguish that performance anxiety to a certain degree. So a really, really interesting field. And um, all I can say is that, you know, there's, we spend probably about close to an hour on just that topic in the course. So um, if you're really interested, um, I invite you to enroll in the course. <laughs> Very good. Um, we're going to do a few more questions. I know your time, you've got about another five or six minutes. Um, this is a, um, I'm just going to read it, but it's got a few little levels. Um, can someone older, let's say in their 60s, who's never consumed cannabis before, accidentally consumes a high amount, say 30 uh, milligrams, can it trigger a manic episode in someone who's bipolar? Yeah, well, theoretically, yes, especially with um, high levels of THC, definitely. Um, CBD, I wouldn't say the same sort of risk, but with THC, yes. And that's why um, psychosis, um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder is a absolute contraindication, um, especially with high THC cannabis. You know, they've seen that in studies that it could potentially do that. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we know for sure that it's causative. Like every time someone who has a history of psychosis consumes a large amount of THC will have a psychotic episode, but they've, they've seen enough evidence to suggest that that's a bad idea. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I wasn't sure if you could answer that, but you answered that. Um, uh, because it was so specific. The next one is specific and then we'll do some, some uh, simpler ones. Now I'm, I'm not going to read this one. I'm going to put it in the chat. Doc, can you open up the chat and read this question? Uh, yes, okay. let me just, just a little orient to myself. Uh, the chat or the Q and A? The chat. The chat. I'm put it in the uh, chat. There. Tell me chat. when you're there and scroll down to the bottom. Scroll down to the bottom. Okay, my daughter. Uh, that one. Yeah. My daughter gave me a bottle of THC, 0 0.07 milligrams per gram. CBD, 10.3 milligrams per gram in liquid form, oh, that's just gonna make things really complicated, uh, to help with my insomnia. Is this the right product for that? And also I am on aspirin therapy and four milligrams of candesartan for high blood pressure. Uh, will one drop cause interactions with these medications? I was told to take one drop, it's one drop on its own okay, or, oops, uh, or on a walnut, half, which was suggested by someone. <laughs> a walnut half, I like that. Um, okay, so this is a bit difficult because it's not easy to convert a gram amount, with, which is like a dry weight amount, to a liquid form. What we'd really need to know is how much THC and CBD are in, are, are there per milliliter or are in the entire bottle? And then what we'd need to know is approximately how much in terms of milliliter is in each drop. And then we could figure out what that dose is per drop. So, you know, sometimes I have, right now, if you go onto the Ontario Cannabis Store, they kind of show you products and how much THC and CBD is in the full bottle. So then if it's like a 30 mil bottle, we divide the two and then we know how much there is per milliliter. And then sometimes it will say how many mils are per drop, like point what mil per drop. So then we can figure out what that dose is. I'm inclined to say one drop's not gonna do much unless you have like a super hyper potent product that's completely illegal and um, that I've never seen before because I've never seen a canvas product so potent that it would have ridiculous amounts per drop. Um, so I, I probably a drop is not going to do any harm. And then to the other part of that question, to help with the insomnia. So for insomnia, on insomnia, you want to look for products that, um, that will uh, be somewhat, you know, sedating. So you're know, looking more towards the indica varieties, um, things with high beta mercine content and, um, usually for, uh, for insomnia and nighttime use, I like sort of a balanced THC to CBD. This one was, I think, uh, more, yeah, more CBD. So you may find, I found in my practice that with insomnia, um, I would say maybe about 
of patients who take cannabis can achieve the desired effect with just CBD for insomnia, but 70% need some balance between THC and, and CBD for, for insomnia. Um, uh, with the uh, aspirin, yeah, shouldn't worry about the aspirin. Um, the cannabis, so the high blood pressure. So again, the um, the only concerning thing about uh, THC in particular with um, with the cardiovascular system is increasing heart rate and decreasing blood pressure. So, if anything, um, we want to just be careful that the two, like the cannabisartan and the whatever you're taking don't synergize so much so that it lowers your blood pressure to a dangerous level. But um, with one drop, I, I don't think it's, it's going to do that at all. Yeah. My instinct is to say that, you know, one drop is going to have an, I've never seen a product that was so potent with one drop that you can achieve a therapeutic level with one drop. Usually we'll need at least 15 to 30 drops of something. Wow. Okay. Well, you're, that is a very thorough answer. <laughs> Thank you. Now it's 820. Uh, do you, um, I can keep going. If it was 420, that'd be funny, but it's 820. <laughs> uh, so uh, just a couple more questions then. So I see that sure. Pinine, my apologies, I don't know what that is, has been shown to have an effect on ADHD. Can you say anything else about cannabis's effect on ADHD? Oh, the pinene. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So for uh, ADHD, um, basically it comes down to that effect on the uh, endocannabinoid system. Oh, I lost you, Julia. Are you still there? Uh, okay, great. Um, so for ADHD, I mean, I, I have these studies on my computer somewhere. It's been a little bit of time since I read them. But basically what it comes down to is that calming effect um, that uh, cannabis can have. So um, <clears throat> the pinene, um, that's been studied with ADHD. Um, I think there's some studies using CBD, uh, with ADHD, maybe even THC. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't give you the specifics of those studies and exactly what products they use. I would have to, I'd have to go back to the studies and, and read them through. So I apologize for that. I was muted for someone with bipolar mood disorder. Why would it be a contraindication? It's because it can, what they've seen in the studies is it could, um, it could cause a psychotic or instigate a psychotic episode, um, potentially in people who've had, um, history or like family history, um, or who've had personal history of psychosis and, and, um, and bipolar. So, you know, the physiology of it, um, I think it's again, more of a concern with high THC, um, causing, you know, these, um, what THC does is, uh, if you take high amounts, it can cause paranoia, it could cause anxiety. Um, so that will just add to those symptoms already happening in, especially a manic episode. Um, and even on the other hand, if we look at some of the more sedating com comative effects of, um, of, uh, of cannabinoids and terpenes, you know, during a depressive uh, episode of bipolar could even be additive towards that. So again, it's more of what they've seen in research. And, um, you know, I think bipolar might be more of like just a concern rather than the actually seeing evidence with bipolar, because I think most of it was with um, schizophrenia. But, um, but again, it's not something you really want to mess with, because that can be, you know, um, a serious, um, even fatal uh, condition. So it's, it's just erring on the side of caution with those. Um, from a very, very positive uh, look through your entire um, uh, presentation, um, unbiased, fantastic. There are some very specific hits that you have that are full on caution. They're full on yield. Yeah. But yeah, but I mean, yeah, I again, find you as being very positive. Yeah. 
for the most part, as you saw, it's one of the safest drugs that you can use. Um, and it's more about how it will affect pre-existing conditions that we have to watch out for. It's not like the cannabis is going to cause something new. It's, you know, are we dealing with an individual where something's kind of festering or may happen and can cannabis kind of be that trigger? Okay. Um, is there a specific dose of CBD oil to take based on an individual's weight? Um, yes and no. So, you know, cannabis is funny. It's one of these drugs that there's really no set algorithm or dosing guidelines based on age and weight. Um, and that's written right on the Health Canada website. Um, so no, because you can have, you know, a 70 year old lady who weighs like 110 pounds and can, you know, take THC like a tank, like give them a hundred milligrams and they barely feel it. And then you have something like, you know, a big seven foot uh, uh, or six foot seven guy um, and uh, just the tiniest amount, like two milligrams THC, they're, they're good. So um, no, but we do see in studies, especially, they're usually dosing based on weight, especially with kids. Um, so when we see those studies, they're saying, okay, this is how many milligrams we gave per kilogram. So then going forward, if we're treating those conditions like epilepsy, we'll probably want to be in that ballpark based on weight. So it's sort of, uh, it's a weird thing, but um, no, everyone physio is, their physiology is going to be different. So the best thing to do with cannabis is to start low and go slow. Um, so the uh, Canadian Pharmacy Association has a little document saying that basically you can raise your dose after every three days. So take, a, you know, the minimal dose for three days and then if nothing's felt, then you can raise it up and then further and further every three days. And um, that's a nice cautious approach to, um, to dosing up your cannabis. Thank you. There are way too many uh, more questions, which is great. Um, I'll ask um, one more and then we will call it an evening. Oh, I don't know which one. Well, I guess you could recommend um, where we can purchase things. So there's a lot of great. Yeah, so that, great that was more of module three. Yeah. Um, so let me summarize. Um, so basically here in Ontario, um, we have a uh, few ways. So first of all, you have to decide whether you're going to go through the med medical stream or the recreational stream. If we decide to go through um, the medical stream, you have to get a medicinal license through um, a med uh, medical licensing clinic or a doctor who works with cannabis. Um, then the paperwork, because what happens there is they connect you with a licensed producer directly. So it's like you're getting it wholesale. So that paperwork takes, you know, it might have gone faster, but way back when I did it, it took about two weeks um, for that paperwork to come through. And then you can order it directly from the licensed producer. It tends to be about $10 cheaper than those same products on the recreational market. Um, if we go through the recreational stream, you have uh, basically two choices. You could either get it through a licensed dispensary, again, with that sort of Ontario approved sign on the window, or through the Ontario Cannabis Store, which is an online platform. It's um, uh, www.ocs. Uh, I think it's CA. Let me just double check. Uh, OCS, yeah, .ca. And uh, that will have all the products. And really the point of that webinar and, and uh, presentation was so that you can kind of start navigating that website a little bit better because knowing you know, what kind of products you want um, to choose for what your needs are. Um, and uh, when you purchase something on that website, it's usually shipped in a few business days. So it is quite quick too. Um, so that's really the, the only two ways. Anything outside of that, is, is, is gray market. So it's not technically legal. So if you're picking up cannabis products at, you know, a health food store, um, it's not legal. If you're picking up cannabis products from a dispensary, but they don't have the uh, Ontario authorized sticker, it's not legal. Um, it's not to say those are bad products. They're just not governed by the government. So it's kind of, you know, use at your own risk. 
I'm confused about that. So you're, you're talking about the shops. So they all have to have what kind of sticker? Um, hold on. Let me just do it. So, so there are tons of them absolutely everywhere. Yeah. And are you saying that some of them are not, um, they shouldn't be um, selling? Yeah. Well. Can you see the sticker? I see. Ontario authorized with the Trillium. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, that's it doesn't have that sticker. It hasn't been regulated by the government. So there, even in my area, um, my condo, which is actually being listed tomorrow. So that's why I've been a basket case. Um, uh, so in my area, we have uh, within four blocks, three illegal dispensaries and two legal. So the illegals actually outnumber the legal ones. But how, and how do they open? I heard that that was happening in Vancouver and it's happening here in my hometown. How is that possible? With a complete disregard for uh, the law. Fortunately, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of them are um, involved in, um, in, uh, um, in uh, what would you call it, uh, um, organized crime. So it's not okay. just cannabis. Well, that's interesting, but I, uh, now very interesting. Okay, so for those of us who are on, I know you could go for another half hour, but um, we have a very um, eager group of people who will be seeing this recording that we're going to send out next week through IHN's Weekly Digest and IHN This Week to all of our subscribers. But thank you so much. Again, total generosity totally get granular you answer our questions like it's the last thing that you're going to do and it's fabulous and i know that you are stacked uh 12 hours a day if not more with your family the kids your work everything that you do so thank you so much and we're so happy for you to be teaching at ihn you're very welcome good to see you again and thanks everyone for joining i really appreciate it because you know if i'm talking to no one it's no fun for me uh so uh again thanks and uh have an excellent evening okay you too thank you so much sean good night Bye, good night